So welcome. Um, today I'm going to have a conversation with uh, author Hugh Fritz. Uh, Hugh is a fan of monsters, mad scientists, sorcerers, and anything that involves beings with incredible power beating each other senseless. Hugh is the author of the Mystic Rampage series, uh, three books, Made to be Broken, Public Displays of Aggression, and Anomaly Aftermath. One reviewer writes, uh, they're for fans of whodunits laced with high fantasy elements. So thank you, Hugh. Welcome. Uh, I'm happy to have you here. Yeah, thanks. I should say that bio is um, how I was. I'm in kind of a state of flux right now. <laughs> You know, I've, you know how it is, like sometimes you watch a comedy for so long and eventually the jokes start to become predictable. <laughs> you feel like you need a change. I read too many um, intensely violent uh, books and now I'm wondering if I should change that, but I'm not sure what I should change it to yet. It's still changing. Mm. Right, right. Yeah, so, uh, so my introduction there just came from um, the Goodreads page, I think, or it's, it's maybe like the back cover, or not the back cover blurb, but like the author, the author blurb. So you're thinking... You think you might want to change that, huh? You've been reading too much violent stuff. When I when I find out more about myself, I need to go on a journey of discovery. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I mean, things change over time, of course, and uh, I completely understand. Well, are you ready to launch in? We'll we'll start talking about your books. Yes. Cool. Um. So. Uh, and, and I'm going to refer to some of your reviews because uh, I read through them. And I've also, of course, read your books. Um, but I'm going to refer to some of your reviews for some of these questions. Uh, one of them says that um, magic is explained by science in your books in a way that is both interesting and full of hope. Um, but my question is just how do you feel about magic systems in general? Do you like hard magic systems, soft magic systems? Do you have a, a favorite author who does – or a favorite magic system – uh, written by another author. With questions like that, I might be um, boring to talk to because usually with things like that, I don't um, like take a strong stance. Like, um, so the way I see, like, being impartial is different than not having an opinion. Like, I do have an opinion, but with things mm -hmm. like this, I'm usually impartial because I can see it going either way. Sure. Um, so, so an author that I do like, Charlie Holmberg, and okay. she has a series called The Paper Magician. And um, that's something I would consider a soft um, fantasy, soft magic. Um, basically, people have objects like paper. They'll turn into, you know, like do origami, turn into a, um, something. And with one word, they can make it animate. Like someone will make an origami heart. Let's say beat, and it beats. So, it's, you know, one word commands. They're not like taken from a secret language. So that's why I consider it soft. Like it seems like something like, you know, not too complicated um, or anything like that. Um, the, one of the downsides I saw with that is that it kind of like took away from one of the big twists in the, one of the, I think it was the second one. Um, one of the villains discovers like a new spell that, you know, completely changes the game, but all they really did was do a spell that was already done and just kind of change a word here or there. So maybe, you know, hmm. really no one's thought of that before, but, um, a benefit yes. of that is that so you had a hard time like, suspending your disbelief on that one. Well, yeah, but the thing is, the benefit of that is that it um, draws the questions that a reader might have towards um, like a more insightful, towards a insightful angle. Like, um, you know, you see all these people with, who can do all these things with just, you know, paper, or rubber, um, when the, a lot of the villains were blood magicians. But the thing is, like, it is so easy, um, but is it right? You know, a lot of the book was based on like the uh, morals of like, you know, what could people do with this kind of power. Mm. So again, it is soft magic. It is suspending disbelief. You're right. But at the same time, it brings up those kinds of um, thoughts. <laughs> so in that book series, which I've not, I'm not familiar with, um, was magic like very, who, who was able to do magic? Was it sort of like a, you're either born with it or you're not, or you learn it? No, or... Anyone could, if they were bound to, um, it had to be an, um, a material that was, um, synthetically created so if someone could bind themselves to rubber they'd be a rubber magician okay <laughs> they bind themselves to paper then they'd be you know an origami magician sure or sure fire magicians things like that they couldn't control air or things like that that humans didn't create but um, okay so it has to be something synthetic interesting 
And then, you know, on the flip side of that, I'm sure you're familiar with um, uh, Brandon Sanderson. You know, if you've read any of his books, you've probably heard of him. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. I have I've both his, read um, some of his Born books. Series. Like, it's through that very hard magic system, you know, it goes into the amount of metals you need. You need those specific metals. I mean, mm. this security or higher, you know, he goes into like the economic impact of metals having <laughs> magical abilities. Sure. You know, it's great for world building, but at the same time, you know, like it draws um, readers to answer, to ask certain questions. Like in that one, I like nerded out, you know, I was my first, the third thing on my mind was like, what if someone took this, ingested this metal and it was 97.9 instead of 98% pure, you know, what's the cutoff? <laughs> Yeah, so you're you're wondering about uh, um, what am I trying to say? Your margins of error on your exactly. on your magic system, um, which is you know something that you're you're knowledgeable about. Your background is chemistry, right? Tell tell us a little bit about that. Um, so I know that's when I didn't exactly have a plan when I got to um, college. I was the undecided uh, people for a long time. I wasn't even sure I wanted to go. My parents uh, pushed me into it, which I'm glad they did. It did eventually, um, you know, work out. But uh, I just, I guess I kind of um, fell into it. <laughs> um, science seemed like um, something that could give me a stable career in the future, more so than um, some of the other, I don't want to say anything specific, but um, I don't know, I fell into it because I guess I was like thinking about like, um, well, my parents would support me going forward. <laughs> <laughs> And, but I did, you know, I didn't exactly have a magic background when I was in high school. I wasn't, you know, like gifted in math or science, but, um, you know, I kept at it for a few years and I did eventually, you know, pull it off because I did eventually, you know, get through the, all the course uh, requirements, which I guess you could say started me on um, being an author. Cause like when I was in, um, when I did decide on chemistry as a major, I guess eventually it became something that I just wanted to see if I could do it. And that's kind of been my um, inspiration for a lot of things that have happened. Like, um, you know, I wrote this book just because I wanted to see if I could, you know. Hmm. If I could. Yeah, I think that's great, you know, setting those challenges for ourselves. I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask was what what inspired you to write this series? Um, do you want to elaborate on that answer? Uh, is there is there do you feel there's more than just sort of a self challenge to it? Or was that a lot of it? No, well, it was more because I had some um, background in it as a hobby. Mm -hmm. um, creative writing started when I was in high school. There was a club that met, um, you know, afterwards. So um, it was like, I don't know, it was an hour in the school library. Um, people like brought in, it was short stories, three pages or less. No one ever had anything longer they were building towards. It was all just like, you know, flash fiction, basically. Or sometimes someone bringing a poem or things like that. Um, so yeah, I had some experience doing things that you know didn't exactly um, have a broad, um, a broad goal, like a far, like a long game. Sure. Uh, but yeah, what was, was the um? So you went to to school in Chicago, right? Yes. What was the what was your club's name? The like writing club, or did literary, it have a name? Literary something. I honestly forget. <laughs> okay. It was just called the Literary Club. <laughs> I was just curious because um, when I was in, and actually I think this might have been even more middle school, um, and I grew up in Ohio, which is not too far away from um, Illinois. Um, there was a, there still is, I believe, I hope it's still going on, a competition called the Power of the Pen. I don't know mm -hmm. if you'd ever heard of that. No. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was it, it had to be very short. Uh, it was a competition, um, so there were there was a time limit, and basically everybody would go into like a classroom and uh, you know have a, I don't know if there was an envelope or just a piece of paper, and then we'd either turn it over or open it up or whatever, and everybody would have a prompt, and so then you'd have I don't remember it was like it was short it was like fifteen or twenty minutes you'd have to write a story. Um, and then you do that, I don't know, like two or three or four times in a one competition day. And they had like judges who were usually just like a bunch of English teachers or maybe just general teachers from that, that could get roped in on the weekend. <laughs> um, and it was a whole thing. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed it. I think at the time I was probably pretty stressed out about it, but, mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, Do you remember I, any prompts that you received? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so uh, I don't know. I don't think I remember any of the prompts and I'm not sure any of my stories ever got digitized because we wrote, we hand wrote them, you know, on paper. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think they might be lost to the sands of time. Um, one of your you like really stuck in your mind because I've done competitions like that too. I didn't do like an envelope. It was um, digital, but yeah, I was emailed a prompt. I had 24 hours to come up with something. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, I don't think I remember any of the prompts off the top of my head. Um, I do remember somebody else's story because I read like some of the stories that won stuff that won prizes or whatever. And some of them were very, I mean, a lot of them were like cutesy. I mean, they're really short, right? So there's a limited amount that anybody could do. Um, and there was one that was a, a drama where all the characters were components of the clock. And like, clearly the student was just like staring at the clock stressed out <laughs> and not knowing what to write. And so they wrote a drama and there was the shorthand and the long hand and the numbers. And even the like little tick marks had their own personality of some kind. I don't remember a lot of the details, but, <laughs> but they had this whole little interaction between all the components of the clock. I don't have a clue what their prompt was, but it was certainly a, a cute little story. It was look at the clock. <laughs> I, I mean, I think we didn't need the prompt to uh, to be looking at the clock uh, for that. All right, back to back to your story here. Um, so one of the things that is somewhat unique, certainly unexpected um, about your stories. Oh, I should I should maybe mention for folks that they're, I think, I think safely categorized as uh, urban fantasy uh, since they're fantasy, but um, set in an urban setting. Um, set in a modern setting uh but rather than having like werewolves vampires wizards um it's genies and you know a, a number of your reviewers sort of comment like oh that's that was cool i didn't expect genies you know i haven't read a book before where that's sort of the um what the magic user is right we're used to sort of wizards and sorcerers and things so why genies in particular well, that happened organically, and it actually started off as Sorcerers. My first um, title was The Rules of Sorcery. The Genies started when I introduced a plot element where my um, eldest main character was responsible for creating other creatures. Um, he was the one who used magic on a dog, and it became a werewolf. Um, he used magic on a firefly, and it became what we know as a fairy. Mm. And after that, I wanted to... Um, I guess that would be a neat um, angle if, you know, the characters themselves were something from, you know, concrete from mythology and not just sorcerers. And since they were, you know, basically all powerful and, you know, e practically eternal, I guess I just kind of settled on uh, genies, although uh, I use that as the name, but uh, from you know, in my book, you can see that it's not like directly like um, taken from what you might be familiar with from like the mythology like um sure, they, they don't kind of like that and yeah they don't come out of lamps yeah, yeah. but the thing is like you know even genies they have um some i guess leeway because you know there's genies there's gin there's ginny um depending on what culture and like you know the americanized version i think a lot of people think of the genie from aladdin with the three wishes of course um there's others though like there's genies that are like fire elementals born of flame and it's not so much like the wishes it's more like they're like creating through sparks but um say so yeah, i did call them uh genies um but like it's not strictly speaking uh genies but i mean that's like sure. an element of urban fantasy these days like um what is an element of urban fantasy these days well like um if you go on amazon and look like urban fantasies with fairies in them like mm -hmm. that's it's popular there's a lot of books with um the fae living among people but they've all you know you, there is pressure to be different so like yeah said it's how do you distinguish yourself right exactly yeah so you know, breaking away from traditional folklore is an element of most urban fantasy um that i've read <laughs> well yeah i mean and i think it would it would have to be even just being in an urban setting um you know it's it's certainly not your your Tolkien, where the, the trees are going to march off to war and, and things like that. There's not enough trees in the urban setting. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe that could be an interesting idea. But um, I do remember in your 
first book, you know, you have a conversation when one of the um, um, how do I non magical character, one of the human normal normies, one of, one of your normies, you know, has a con- ha- learns about the genies and sort of has that goes through that conversation of like, oh, you know, do I get three wishes and are you bound to me? And like, I do think uh, I do think genies are sort of a rich um, a rich mythology because of. Uh, you know, kind of going back to the magic systems, hard and soft magic systems, because of the rules. Because um, even if you have put your own spin on it, there is sort of an expectation that okay, there's at least some kind of rules that we need to negotiate. And I think that's always just sort of a fun, a, a fun thing to have in books because it sort of it lays out how the game is going to be played. Yeah, I did bring that up eventually, and I don't know if it was um, a good choice, but. Um... I was born, I was raised uh, Lutheran when I was growing up. And that's why when they do bring up like the, you know, the rules that they have to follow, there's 10 of them. It's like a call out to the 10 commandments. Mm. <laughs> so in that way, it's like, you know, blending, <laughs> I, I may regret calling Lutheranism folklore, but blending folklore. <laughs> sure, sure. And I don't know, three or 10 or, you know, these are all good numbers. I think, uh, <laughs> I think it's fun to have rules like that. Yeah. Um, so we started talking about urban fantasy, and I can't say that I've – I don't feel like I've read a lot of urban fantasy myself. Um, I did recently uh, read my first uh, Jim Butcher Dresden Files book, and um, I, I don't have a review in front of me that I wrote down, but I'm pretty sure people have compared your series to the Dresden Files. And I was wondering what you thought about that comparison. So I haven't read the entire Dresden Files series. I read the first one. I think it was called Stormfront. Sure. And I I, I picked up a book from a library book sale. I read the 11th one just like by itself. <laughs> okay. Um, so I haven't gotten up to the 11th. So I don't know if the series um, changes over time. Sure. Um, personally, I think that Jim Butcher in his series, um, he has a few more comedic um, and outlandish elements in it than I do. Um, in the first one, one of the characters was um, a severed head that could still talk. <laughs> um, one of the uh, mishaps is that the um, main character, the wizard, um, accidentally gives someone a love potion. <laughs> sure. During a fight. <laughs> I'm, I like that as compared to the Dresden Files because it does have the element of like um, a person, like a magical being living in a modern day you know, busy city. Yeah. Not exactly secret, but aloof. Yeah, that's a good way of phrasing it. Um, the secrecy does seem to be a little wishy-washy in uh, in the Dresden Files of like, oh, we just sweep things under the rug when we need to with some, you know, magical excuse, even though it's like, you guys just had like a huge werewolf brawl like on Main Street or something. <laughs> Yeah, so you get even uh, so you get more uh, brawls in the later ones. <laughs> certainly, certainly. Not they didn't actually have it on Main Street, but like there is this big fight that they have, and they're like, "Oh well, it's it's at night, and we've got some you know mechanisms for sweeping it all under the rug." And uh-huh. um, I might get back into that series. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, maybe you might check it out. Um, I definitely did. Uh, I think I would have independently thought of some compare. I th- would have uh, thought of your series, if um, even if no one else had suggested it when I read uh, the the eleventh book that I read. Um, yeah, it I does. Clarence is similar to. Uh, man, I forget. Yeah, yeah, he's sort of he's sort of wisecracking, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think there are definitely some comparisons there. Anyway, I was just curious. Um, it's a. Uh, and sort of just like the slam bang style, fast paced action. Um, I think I think there are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, reasons for comparison. So if any readers are into the Dresden Files, should check out the Mystic Rampage series. What's the first book? The first book is Made to Be Broken. Made to Be Broken. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that you and I were talking about uh, ahead of ahead of this discussion, we decided to have here was about how you were getting some feedback that your books weren't sort of in a neat genre and particularly it was the issue of there were some aspects that felt more i don't know if you they, they said young adult but it felt like a little bit younger geared and then there was like 
sort of the the violence and gore and and there were parts that were sort of certainly reading as more adult and even at the beginning you know you were saying that like uh you know your taste in in reading has maybe gone a little bit further away from from the violence so i don't know tell me tell me a little bit more about that uh and, and what you think of that so yes um i have gotten when i did um pitch this um book it was difficult because that was part of it you know it has genies who you know cast spells and you know they seem like the you know child heroes that are gonna uh, you know, um, look out for you and like almost like guardian angels mm -hmm. but then there is a character whose backstory involves her father being murdered by a serial killer and her exacting revenge and you know one of the characters is a zombie who died from gunshot wounds so you know that's also kind of a <laughs> and is kind of a gross individual he's kind of like falling apart in a lot of scenes yes he is a he is a um, magically animated corpse but you yeah know, he's still a corpse he's got scars <laughs> so um but honestly i don't think that's um a bad thing um it's it makes my book less mainstream but i don't think it makes it um like i don't think it diminishes the quality of like the story arc um and i don't think there's anything wrong with having like a voice that doesn't fit into a specific genre like um in the artemis fowl series like if you were again from the first one like you might be a little bit surprised because you know they are it is an underground literally underground world with magical creatures but you know they're fairies with guns and magical technology you know and i came across when i was young i didn't have a lot of um previous experience in books like that. But, you know, when I picked up the first one, I was pretty surprised seeing a fairy pack in heat. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, over time, um, what's the name, Owen Colfer, you know, he kept up that voice. It became clear that that is the kind of book that he liked to write. And, you know, that became his voice throughout the entire Artemis Fowl series. So I guess um, my answer is that, you know, I don't want to change. I'm going to keep this up. It just means I have to write more to establish that this is, you know, the kind of thing that I do. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's great. And I agree that, I mean, I don't think there's any author out there that's in love with uh, genre labels. You know, I think that the genre labels we have are ephemeral. They're not timeless and they're never going to be timeless. Um, it's just like, oh yeah, you know, maybe that works as a way to talk about this particular group of books, but, um, you know, the Lord of the Rings, uh, you know, one of the most successful book series of all time, uh, sort of said, no, this is what I, you know, Tolkien said, this is what I want to write about. And, uh, hopefully people want to read about it. And it turned out they did. Um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, I think the, the genre convention, you know, when people are like, oh, this doesn't really fit into various uh, conventions, it's like, okay, you know, maybe those conventions need to change. And I think, I think certainly genre conventions are just very limiting and silly. So um, when you publish, do you have any thoughts on like the self-publishing world? Because like, I get that. In terms of genre or in terms of other stuff? Well, it goes along with that because I know that publishers like a certain genre because it, you know, gives them a clear path for advertising. Like, you know, they have ways of advertising an urban fantasy. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, it gets an advertisement is supposed to be brief. You know, you can't say this is an urban fantasy, but it has all these other elements that older viewers might be interested in or like younger reason I want to stay away from. Yeah. Like, you know, Self-publishing, you just kind of like you can just put it out there and see what happens without bringing you have to advertise a little bit, but you can, like take your time. So, yeah, arguments. <laughs> Self. I mean, no. I think that I think that when you write a story, um, as I did, and as it sounds like you did as well, and you're writing it from a place of, hey, this is what I'm interested in, and and this is a story that I want to tell, rather than starting with, this is how I intend to market it. This is my target audience. I think you're going to have a hard time fitting it. I mean, unless you're lucky, I guess, and it just happens to fit squarely into some particular genre. I think you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have a hard time marketing it and and convincing an agent to take it on. You know, when I even even so so Crew of Exiles is my novel, and even when I got to the point where okay, I'm going to sell it on Amazon, and I need to select 
the the categories and subcategories that it's going to appear under on Amazon, right? You know, science fiction adventure uh, versus, I mean, there's like science fiction mystery. There's like science fiction. Oh man, I had this list actually relatively recently that I looked at. It gets really niche. Like I think there was even I think one of the ones that surprised me was it was like science fiction dark comedy. Like that is so specific. And at the same time, I didn't have one that fit me better than science fiction adventure, which is honestly one of the more general categories that they have. Um, and you don't want that as an author. You actually want one of the very specific ones because you want to find your people and target your people really accurately. But, you know, mine is sort of a um, optimistic, uh, multi-perspective um, – I was really trying to work the word transcendent in, right? One of my characters is this transcendent being who gets uh, shoved down into a, a human body and then has to like, I mean, in a similar way to like, oh, I'm a genie stuck in a lamp, right? It's kind of that mm -hmm. same feel, if not the same um, mythology. And there is a category for like transcendental science fiction, but that doesn't mean what I wanted it to mean. <laughs> and so um, it was really hard to promote and present because when you do just say one of the generic big categories, science fiction adventure, you're then competing against the big category, right? You're in, you're in the big pond, right? You want to be the big fish in the little pond, not the <laughs> whatever size fish in the big pond. You just don't want to be in the big pond. There's too many fish. Back to all the fairy urban fantasies. You know, how do you stand out when someone looks that up and they see, you know, hundreds or thousands of results? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like how so, many books right now are about magical schools? <laughs> right. Oh yeah. I mean, and in and magical schools, I mean, have been huge ever since and probably even before Harry Potter came out. Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> um so yeah, there's there's a ton of I mean there's a ton of genre chasing, there's a ton of like popularity chasing. You know, when um uh what was the book? Oh, the one that was made into the movie with like Katniss Everdeen. One of my oh, Hunger, Hunger Games. Games, Hunger Games. Right? Hunger Games came out and then there were a bunch of copycats of Hunger Games, right? And and you see these things sort of go around and around and it's really challenging because I want to write what I want to write, and I hope that other people want to read it. But uh, yeah, sometimes the market is not <laughs> aligned to that, I would say. I have gotten more into the self-publishing uh, realm lately. I mean, part of it was because my publisher went out of business. So there's, well, I don't want to say out of business. It was bought out. Um, but yeah, that's why there's multiple uh, versions of my book on Amazon right now. I'm still in the process of republishing the third one. <laughs> Yeah, so do do I think it would be interesting to hear about some of, of your experience with publishing. Tell 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 your story about that. Well, I do. I'm looking forward to giving the self publishing um, a try because it would give me more, I guess, um, control and I guess just the information. Um, I mean, you do when you do have to have a traditional publisher, you know, part of it is like how willing they are to like give you like that update information. Like, can they do you have a schedule to follow up with? Um, for me, like a lot of our conversations were like year-end conversations. It's mm -hmm. not like about how things are going at the end of the year. Um, they did help me out. They put me into like uh, competitions, but um, they would let me know after the fact, you know, like we didn't like meet in person to like go over like, what do you think would be a good place to enter? Gotcha. Um, you know, they like, they decided that it would, and um, I, you know, they chose good competitions. I mean, I, my book placed a, as like a finalist in one and, you know, I've submitted it, um, made to be broken to other competitions and it's, um, gotten a literary Titan award. And, um, one of the books got a book fest award. I think it was the second one. Yeah. But yeah, like, um, we were all both kind of doing our own thing, um, various levels of success. Um, you know, so it seemed disconnected at mm -hmm. some time. But that's kind of um, something you got to prepare for when it's a self-publisher because it depends on how many clients they have and like who they, you know, you're kind of competition with your coworkers in a way, you know. For the like attention of the publisher? Right. Um, yeah. There was one person they um, put a lot of their time in. There was um, How My Brain Worked, which is kind of like um, a modern day health and wellness um, examination um, relating diets to, you know, state of, um, you know, 
biological, I don't know what the word is, health. <laughs> okay. But um, yeah, I guess that was kind of like the direction that they took. Um, they still accepted my books. They still, you know, did their best to uh, market it. But, you know, they were always like going for other people as well. Sure, sure. So I guess um, with self-publishing, I am looking forward to, um, you know, it seems weird, but it's solitary marketing also means you're connected <laughs> in a way because, you know. <laughs> Because it's you, anybody. it's just you're not you. gonna have miscommunications with yourself, right? <laughs> well, I I still can. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's, that's a good point. I, my mind has a brain of its own sometimes. <laughs> that's <laughs> well said. Yeah. Um. So so just to be clear, so what happened was your um the publisher that you were going through uh I think you say got bought by someone else. The rights to uh your books reverted to you. And now you're in the process of sort of re re putting them up on uh, Amazon and and wherever um, with you as the let's say publisher rather than as the company that you had previously published through. Is that yes. accurate? Okay. Yes. Okay. Just for you know viewers to to clarify what we're talking about um because obviously we've talked you know uh, before this and outside of this conversation yeah well uh it'll already have been released once once this goes up on my channel but uh i will have relatively recently released a video on my whole self publishing process so people can see just like what my whole experience of self publishing what that was like and yeah anyway there's a whole video on that Looking forward to it. I'd like to compare, um, I guess, ex experiences. Sure. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, I wanted, I want to put some more stuff up in general, just being like, hey, here's what my experience is. I would like eventually, I haven't recorded any of it yet, but I'd like eventually to do one on the querying process, right? How to get a literary agent and just let people know, like, yeah, this is how I'm doing it. I'm not saying it's the right way or the wrong way. It's just, my experience because I actually, I mean, I've kind of looked and I don't see a lot of videos. YouTube is where I'm looking. I haven't seen a lot of videos on what is the experience. You can find plenty of stuff where people are trying to give you advice. Oh, you should write your query letter this way. You should format your synopsis this way. But I don't see a lot about like, yeah, okay, but what is it like to spend a couple hours? querying agents you know sort of where do you start and how do you decide on an agent and once you decide on one you know what research do you need to do anyway so that's my idea for that were video. all of yours done through um emails or did you meet anybody face to face yeah that's a good question so almost all of the stuff all the stuff i'm doing right now is online either through um Oh, it's all, either called Query Manager or Query Tracker. There's like a website. It's called one of those two things. I don't know if Manager or Tracker or through e email, just direct email. Um, I have, however, pitched to one agent or a couple agents maybe in person um, at an event that I went to hosted at University of New Mexico. I had only been to that once uh, and and I did, you know, just I think it was just like one or two pitches to the agents that were there. And that is a very different experience. Um, and I I did see lots of advice videos on that, you know, things about crafting your your elevator pitch. Can you say in 15 to 30 words, what is your story? And, you know, you got to make sure that you're not just sitting there sort of like telling the whole story, but like hooking them in. I mean, it's very much sort of a conversational version of the written querying process, I would say. Have you done have you done in persons? I have, and that was actually how I um, landed the deal with my publisher when we met. Oh, neat! And it helped because they um, they weren't interested at first. With um, so I had a um, my other pitch, you know, briefly. I said that you know it's a urban fantasy, you know, about genies, and it outlined what they could do. And um, the representative that I met wasn't interested at first because he said that my characters seemed too powerful for it to be hmm. interesting. But um, because we were face to face, we were able to. I was able to talk about how, like, yes, they are powerful, but you know, here's what I'm going for with the characters. You know, of a genie who, you know, he's a family man. You know, he uses his powers to help his family, and that contradicts or 
con uh, conflicts with this other person who's basically a magic cop and unfortunately the family man used to be a criminal so <laughs> the, mm. it was able to bring up specific tension points and that's what eventually drew them in oh nice yeah i mean that's a good point that when it's a conversation you can sort of I mean, you can adapt. You can you can explain yourself uh, when they have a, a a point that they don't care for. With the digital, with the email querying, you know, it's just form responses like, "Oh, good luck with your query, but I am not going to accept this at this time, or I'm not interested, or you know, whatever." <laughs> I'd argue that there should be more events with um, publishers to meet with authors. <laughs> it would be really nice, you know. I I wonder if I I say this not having looked specifically, but it would be great if there was some sort of online event where it could just be sort of one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings and it's a set period of time and you go from, you know, this one to the next, to the next, to the next or something like that. Because I understand it's hard, you know, I mean, we both live in, in Albuquerque, um, but uh, <laughs> people aren't flying into Albuquerque for no particular reason. So uh, it's not exactly New York or Los Angeles, right? Right. Um, but yeah, it, it would be nice to have more of that opportunity because it's hard also, like we were talking earlier, when you're trying to market yourself and say like, oh, I'm this genre, but I've got these special features. It's similar with agents. You know, The agents will say, oh, I'm interested in this and that and the other thing. And you have to feel like, okay, well, I think this agent is the closest fit for my story, but it's not perfect. I mean, it's never going to be perfect. Um, I mean, we can dream, I guess, that it could be perfect, but not been that's not been my experience. Well, we've already started to talk a little bit about writing, uh, skipped right to the querying and stuff part. One question I have is that when I read your books, one of the things that I was delighted by and impressed by was how strong book three was, that it had not only a a conclusion, like it did actually end, um, but it had, I thought, a satisfying conclusion. And even as we were building toward that conclusion in book three, um, you continued to develop the characters and world build. And I thought that was fantastic because in a lot of series in general, and perhaps even urban fantasy in particular, I feel like there's sort of a uh, oh well, I'm just going to keep dribbling out books, and I, I you know, going to milk this cow for as long as I can. Um, so I was really delighted by that. And my question is, how much did you plan a lot of this ahead of time, or did you sort of put the pieces together in book three when you got there? No, I did have it planned out ahead of time. I knew from the beginning that I wanted to paint myself into a corner. Mm. Because I've also come across series like that um, in my um, grotesque violence phase. Like I said, it's starting to phase out now, but I got into extreme horror. One of the um, authors that I have followed, um, uh, Conrath, Joe Conrath, he has one called um, the Jack Daniels series about a detective named Jack Daniels who just meets up with the most ruthless, sadistic killers that Chicago has to offer. And that one did end, but mm. there's like this extended <laughs> period, like the books ended, um, I think with book eight, it was called Cherry Bomb, and now there's almost 20 of them. <laughs> oh, it ended and then the author like went back to it and added because more? It is like, um, it's about, you know, a cop who looks for a serial killer. So, you know, we, I guess um, the author gets another idea for another serial killer and they think, hey, this would be good for Jack Daniels to go after so they put it back. And I haven't read a lot of the newer ones because I liked the way it ended, you know, 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I knew that I didn't want to go down there. And, you know, same thing if you've ever read the uh, Hollows series from Kim Harrison. Like, I liked the way The Witch with No Name ended. Mm -hmm. And um, then Kim Harrison did another series, um, you know, with the memory erasers. I guess that one didn't do too well. So she's going back into the Hollow series and, like, reviving the character who's already had their... Um, you know, big payoffs. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. I knew that I wanted to make it clear that I'm not going on with this. Like, even if this book does take off and become super popular, like, there's really no way I could revive, bring back the characters to have them come back for one more adventure. There's just nothing that could um, get them back in the game at this point. <laughs> I mean, and I think I think that is a good way 
to write. Um, I'm impressed that you did have a plan ahead of time because uh, I often have to fig even for a single book have to figure out my plan sort of after I've done a draft one. But um, yeah, I liked that phrase you used of I intentionally wrote myself into a corner and like. Yes, that's that's what we should be doing. Like you want to write your character into a corner in the sense of like it seems like they can't get out of the situation and then of course they they succeed or or I guess if it's tragedy they fail. Um but uh but also having a conclusion. Uh it's so nice. I am not the biggest fan. I'm certainly not a fan of series that go on and on and on endlessly. And even series I love standalone books personally. So I I appreciate a series that can conclude nicely it even happens on tv i don't know if you follow the comedian brent but he made no. a show called corner gas and it's a canadian show when it was one of the most popular comedies for years and you know it went on to become a movie and then it was revamped into a cartoon but you know even after the cartoon went on for a few seasons in an interview brent said you know he realizes that he's at risk of just driving this into the ground yeah because there's a pretty simple idea. It's called Corner Gas because it takes place at a gas station. It's about the attendant and his friends. And there's only so much you can do with that. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, there's innumerable series, television and otherwise, that do sort of just go on and on and on. And we're like, oh, they've certainly run out of ideas. And uh, yeah. in this, I mean, I mean drama pulled it off for a while. I was really into a lot of the. Um, but when, I guess reboots, rehashes, you know, even if it was canceled, when it came back, I was immediately right back into it. I mean, I tried the Hulu if, one. It if was they're good, good, they're good. It didn't suck me in as much as the other ones, though. <laughs> well, that's great. I mean, and Futurama, right? So it makes me think of The Simpsons, right? Mm -hmm. And The Simpsons has been going on forever and ever and ever. And most of the, the fans will tell you that it's really gone downhill. Um, but also, uh, there's an interesting phenomenon where there's conspiracy theories that have arisen around uh, – oh, man, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Matt Gro Groening? Groening, I think. Groening? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that guy. Um, and they, they're literally – and I'm serious here. There are some people that believe that The Simpsons, like, you know, oh, they predicted these things that then happened later. Some people literally have some very out there theories about uh, that guy, that writer – for the Simpsons. And, you know, I was talking to my wife and we were just laughing because like, I think these conspiracy, you know, we both agree these conspiracy theorists don't understand the amount of creative output that is required to sustain a show for that long. Like it's going to get some things right by happenstance. <laughs> you <know? laughs> when you put out that much content, I think you're going to, you're going to predict some things by accident from time to time. Well, I think that the um, word prediction needs to be uh, reevaluated. I've seen some of those too. Like there was an episode of The Simpsons where there was a viral outbreak and it wasn't the main part of the plot of the show. There was just like a new flu that um, was going after the, or just everyone was getting sick of the uh, flu. And um, people said that they predicted COVID, but you know, that's just imitating, that's just taking from reality. You know, diseases happen. Yeah. <laughs> predict a global pandemic <laughs> right yeah i agree that um right there's some loose things that are being called prediction i hope no one looks at mine and finds something i predicted <laughs> there I, are people yeah. have guns in my store they do shoot each other that doesn't mean predicted <laughs> you predicted you shooting. predicted <laughs> mass shootings Hugh. <laughs> <laughs> no um yeah likewise with mine i can't imagine it's not really the sort of story i'm writing i think that would be hard to predict things i did predict um animated tattoos i i think uh i think that is a a possible technology that could be eventually exist mm -hmm. a little animation that runs under your skin so i'm gonna go with that one animated tattoos so you heard it here first what would yours be <laughs> oh what would my animated tattoo be oh what a great question that i have no answer to um, I don't have any tattoos, uh, and and so I I definitely have not even thought of an animated one. Wow, um, the first thing that pops to my mind is like I'd get like a a a scrolling like buy my book, and it would just be an advertisement for my book. <laughs> um, no, I have no idea. I have no idea. Do you have any ideas for yourself? 
first thing that comes to my mind is a person's face with hair that grows really long and just repeatedly, you know, short, long beard, nice short, long. yeah yeah i think yeah like like a barber pole like a rotating like barber pole you know that'd be a fun one um it's all kinds of things you can do well i've had a great time we're we're probably running up on time relatively soon um some of my my latter questions here are uh things we've touched on you know we talked about a little bit when you started writing i have a generic question of like do you have a favorite book or a favorite author how about that one Um, so I don't know about favorite, but I guess one that stuck with me, um, it was also part of a series. Um, it was another fantasy. It was called Del Toro Quest. Yeah, it was a typical chosen one seeking a MacGuffin. Um, Okay. you had to find a series of gems for something that could defeat evil. But what got me about that, maybe just because I read it when I was younger, is that um, it was the first book where the author, like, um, didn't just introduce puzzles, but like actually like put them in front of you and like push you to solve them yourself. Hmm. Like there was like, it would be like a, a part where like people had to get across a death trap by jumping on certain stones. And like on the next page, it would actually be a diagram of those stones, like, you know, one, two, three, four. And Oh, like, neat. you know, they pick the right stones, like using information they already gathered, like what are the right numbers? But, like it puts it in front of you. And like, you have to like figure out like, okay, well, if I were them, what would I jump on, you know? And like, they did the whole thing of like backwards talking. Um, so Mm-hmm. it seems like they're all speaking a different language, but then the person realizes, wait a minute, that's the, that's this word backwards. And then like the character thinks back to all the other things that they've said and tries to like piece together what they're saying. But you know, as the reader, you can just like flip back and look at Sure. it. And the other reason you want to do that is because like in that scene, it was kind of like um, a Hansel and Gretel situation The people who own the house are planning on eating their residents, which is pretty too dark for a children's story. The author got away with it because, you know, it was all backwards and it was like part of it was working in the story like, you know, wait a minute, you flip back and they're just being totally upfront about it. Like it's all backwards, but they're saying, you know, we're going <laughs> to kill you and put you in the oven. <laughs> I love it. I think that's delightful. Well, not the children eating part, but the um the mystery solving You part. weren't children at the time. <laughs> um, I more by happenstance than by planning have read basically like three murder mysteries in a row. And one of the things that really strikes me is that I I really find myself wishing that the mysteries were more solvable by me, the reader, ahead of time. And certainly like some little clues are like, oh, okay, I, I see that, that I could have pieced that together or whatever. But in most of them, it's like, aha, and this is the murderer. And I'm like, oh, who? Or, or like that guy, like who we've hardly seen. Like, I don't know. All I'm saying is um, I really love the idea that like, yes, solvable mysteries for the reader. And I think that's really hard. And, you know, we, we really love authors that can do it well, but uh, because it is, you know, how do you, you know, some readers are going to be able to solve it and some readers are reading too fast or not paying enough attention or whatever and not going to, but um, that does sound like a really fun Um, book or, or book series was it that you It were describing was a series, yeah. Each yeah book, the uh, character found another gem. <laughs> yeah Doesn't that sounds like a really delightful delightful series the del Tora Cron Del uh, Toro Quest. quest del Tora quest all right what's next for you Hugh what are you what are you up to next Well, like I said, I'm trying to establish my voice, so my answer to that was to keep writing, and I am a good doing answer that. Um, my problem is I've taken on a few too many uh, projects. Hmm. to focus on anything in particular. So I do have, I revived an old um, NaNoWriMo project that I've more or less completed. And that one I'm going to try and traditionally publish. It's a traditional fantasy, um, focuses on a dragon in a make-believe kingdom. Um, I still need to expand a few of the characters before I um, start to query it. Um, I haven't done that lately because there's another story that I want to write And that one I plan on not traditionally publishing. That'll just be me doing my own thing. But that's the one that I've just started. So I want to like, I want to, you know, make some ground on that. But I also want to, you know, complete the other fantasy one. And yeah, I've been so busy. I haven't even updated my website lately. <laughs> Yeah, that's I mean that's the writer experience, right? Being being pulled apart by all your own projects. 
I uh, am in a similar situation with um, a couple different works in progress who sort of alternately pull my attention in different directions. I, my, what I'm really trying to do is not something that I'm experienced at, which is plan more upfront rather than just write. And I don't know if I would call it writing myself into a corner, more like writing myself into a pretzel and realizing I need a you know a straight line when i have a pretzel but uh that's what i've been working on well sure. thank you again for for uh i don't know coming on with this uh it was fun to to chat and go through some formal questions um again for anybody watching uh hugh fritz author of made to be broken public display of aggression anomaly aftermath and hopefully more in the future so you have any closing closing thoughts for us or shall we sign off here we can sign off thanks for thanks for taking the time to talk <laughs> absolutely you're very welcome have a good weekend <laughs> thank you you too have a good weekend